Hello and welcome to a special edition of Spoiler Talk, where I describe more in depth about a show I recently viewed, giving away major plot details in order for my audience to better understand my opinion on the show. Today, this is a follow up to a review of one of the worst anime I have ever seen in my life, Master of Martial Hearts. However, this spoiler talk will not be a near random set of points about what I like slash dislike about the show, uh, unlike previous spoiler talks, no. This video will be me talking extensively on the final episode. I'm gonna go into the plot, mention some of the twists involved, talk about the animation at some points, explain why I felt it didn't work well, and even continue talking afterwards. So if you don't want the show ruined for you, if you somehow have interest in this show, then proceed no more. For everyone else, gather around for this wonderful campfire story. But before I begin, quick recap leading up to this point. <gasps> Main protagonist, Aya Isashima, and her best friend, Natsumi Hanma, find a Miko in a flight attendant fighting in the street during their trip home from school. Aya helps Mika out and drops by at a burger joint afterwards where Natsumi talks about the martial heart. Tournament, only women can participate, heart's desire, uh, adds a surprise, blah blah blah, etc, etc. Then Miko shows up and explains her modes for the martial heart tournament were to make friends. But since Miko already befriended Aya and Natsumi on the spot, she withdraws only for Aya to take her place in the tournament. She fights the flight attendant in an unofficial match and wins. Later, she discovers that Miko completely disappeared from existence because the loser goes to the dark realm. So Aya continues to fight in the martial heart for answers. Her next to the opponents were a teacher, Misuma, some female wretch swinging mechanic, the Daimonji sisters who are cop nurse and geisha. And after defeating the sisters, Aya meets the secretary in a glimpse of the masked man of the tournament who looks like Aya's crush Haruki. Aya questions whether or not this is in fact Haruki, but doubts it. Then she fights some magic maid idol girl at a cafe only to win because she wore the legendary cat ears. Then finally she meets her final opponent in Yokohana, a lady in red who's a psychic and uses her abilities to school Aya gaining the upper hand. And now, the final episode. Now in my review, I mentioned that the tone of the show show is a little rocky. It starts up pretty lighthearted, friendly, yada yada yada. Then it gets a little on the moody side after every episode ending. But the tone of this episode just gets bizarre, and I'm quoting from one of my favorite stand-up comics, Patton Oswalt. The show just takes a hard left turn into assholeville. So hang on. Get your seatbelts ready. Aya's fighting the psychic lady in red whose name was not given in the English dub, but apparently it's Ryu Getsure. She's a psychic that can read Aya's mind or heart. Yeah, she actually says she can look into a person's heart, not their mind, whatever. And she is able to predict Aya's attacks and was, like I said before, gaining the upper hand. Oh, in this fight, this fight particular, Natsume, who watched and cheered through all of Aya's previous fights, wasn't there to support her in this match. The psychic taunts Aya and claims that she has a superiority complex for befriending Miko, and her reasons for fighting are for more selfish reasons and that she actually enjoys fighting. So, a psychic taunting her opponent with some serious anger issues that help her overcome most of her battles, I wonder how this will turn out. Obviously not so well for Getsure, as she's last shown in a puddle of blood all coming out of her head as Aya continues to punch her skull in. By the way, regarding animation, I've never seen a character who's beating someone past their death looking so bored in doing so. No, really, she, she actually looked bored punching her already dead opponent. But as Aya was doing that, a familiar face shows up, and it's none other than Miko. <gasps> you see that? That must mean Aya won the martial hearts and got her wish after all. The person she's fighting for the whole time. She's okay. She's alive. Hang on. Miko takes Aya to some dark room in some big building. It could be a basement, an upper floor. No idea. Uh, I know they took an elevator there. But, and, and the room itself uh, has no walls or ceiling. It's all, you know, pitch black. They call it artistic. I call it lazy. And Miko shows her something that's very, very, very disturbing. Uh, more fucked up than anything I've ever seen, and I've seen Saya no Uta, mind you. This is not the dumbest moment in this anime, but it's probably going to be the most uncomfortable moment for the audience. Miko reveals the location of Aya's missing teacher, Misuma, who is on her knees, hands tied from the ceiling, and is breathing and giggling like a brain-dead asylum patient. Oh, but that's not all. 
Then Miko reveals all the other opponents, and they're in pretty similar mental states. Damage clothes intact as well. Miko reveals that the martial heart... This part's, this part's really messed up, uh, but I have to explain it to you guys. Miko reveals that the martial heart is also a business where they gather strong, powerful women, trick them into entering the tournament with their heart's desire, and if they lose, they become brain-damaged sex slaves that are auctioned off, and Miko was in fact involved in this business. She then continues to berate and insult Aya for what's happened to her opponents and adds more insult to injury by explaining that the opponents, in fact, had pretty good reasons to participate. For example, the flight attendant. She participated in the tournament because she needed financial support for her ill brother that she had to raise by herself. Now the brother's dead? And the flight attendant's eating food pellets off the floor given by Miko. I also want to point out that a couple times Miko actually said these women participate regardless on how big the risk is. I, I have a question, uh, fat guy in the audience right here. That these women actually did know if they lose they would turn out like this. I didn't know that till now. And the rumor before was just some dark realm crap. If they get de defeated, they disappear or some shit. Uh, whatever. Regardless of the motivation, who would willingly participate if they knew this would happen? Oh, but ladies and gentlemen, that's not the worst of it. There's more to come. Miko continues to blame Aya, saying it's her fault that her opponents are in the state they're in now, and before Miko explains why she wanted Aya to suffer, she's interrupted by the tournament head and his assistant, Hayakawa. Apparently, the headmaster wants to have Aya all for himself, much to Miko's dismay. Oh, and the reason why he looks like Aya's crush, Haruki? Um, it's because he uses plastic surgery to make himself more appealing to the women he wants. So Miko pulls out a gun only to be interrupted by Hayakawa and she is getting choked to death. The headmaster agrees to let go of Miko in exchange for Aya. And Miko, despite acting like a card carrying villain and admitting wanting to see Aya suffer not two minutes ago, is begging Aya for help saying because they're friends, right? No, bitch. No. No. And Aya, she just looks there dumbfounded. I mean, come on. However, Hayakawa gets interrupted by three gunshots to the back and dies immediately, and it was revealed that the shooter was the real Haruki Hanma, Aya's crush and Natsumi's brother. Haruki then shoots the tournament leader guy in the head, killing him immediately, so those two characters that just showed up, they were there to just fucking die? Well anyways, Aya's other best friend Natsume, who was Aya's best friend before the beginning of the first episode as it was blankly exposited, shows up along with Haruki, and it turns out she's a bitch too. As it turns out, Miko Kazuki, Haruki Hanma, and Natsume Hanma, her only friends, organized the entire martial heart tournament, even manipulating the now-dead chairman as a means of getting revenge against Aya. For what, you may ask? Oh boy, you're gonna love this. Follow this logic train to oblivion with me. On Miko's fourth birthday, her rageaholic abusive father and her mother got into a fight that ended with both of them stabbing each other to death in which she witnessed from start to finish. The mother's name was Yumi Kazuki, but her father's name was Shigeyuki Iseshima, Aya's father. So Miko's been pretty pissed off for 15 years at Aya and her family. Oh, and uh, another thing, uh, Haruki was actually Miko's boyfriend the whole time, so... Psh. Later, Natsume, after laughing at Aya for not knowing Haruki was in a relationship, explains that the martial heart business was founded over 20 years ago by her father, with the exact same practices as the martial heart now, slaves and everything. And two noteworthy participants were a couple sisters, Yumi Kazuki, already established as Miko's mom, and Kumi Kazuki, who was Natsume and Haruki's mother. They lost to Suzuko Kano, or now she's known as Suzuko Ishishima, Aya's mother. However, Natsumi said that the match was actually rigged by Shigeyuki for Suzuko to win, using Yumi and Kumi's sisterly bond against them, just like how Aya beat the Daimanji sisters. 
As a result, Yumi was forced to live with Shigeyuki, and Kumi was muted and ready to be sold to a man overseas. This was all according to Suzuko's design, but Kumi managed to escape. However, she will never be able to speak again. Kumi went on to tell this story to her children by either writing it out or in sign language. So afterwards, Miko met Natsume and Haruki, found out that they have aggression that came from the same source, and worked together to restart the martial heart tournament and get Aya to participate, so they can make her just as fucking cold-hearted and evil as her mother. Which would also make her responsible for her sins as well as the sins of her mother. They claim that her blood is overflowing with violence and evil. Oh, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to comment more about this after I'm done summarizing. Oh, and, and the cell phone charms I received from Miko in the first episode, it was just a tracking device and a microphone. Afterwards, Natsumi hands Aya a gun so she can kill herself with it. Unfortunately, our now new villains aren't that stupid because when Aya was going to go shoot them in the face, the gun wasn't even loaded. So instead, Haruki, Natsume, and Miko slowly approach Aya with handguns, and just when Aya was ready to defend herself, Natsume brings up the Lady in Red's death, causing Aya to go into a breakdown. Considering the fate revealed to those who lost in the tournament and still survived, Aya killing her was far more merciful, but that's just me. That's my opinion. Whatever. Natsumi shoots Aya in the shoulder, Miko shoots her, uh, Aya in the thigh, Aya screaming in pain, while the assholes laugh about it, saying that she looked like a dying frog. And they even considered cutting her fingers, scooping out her eyes, or cutting her voice box out. So wait, who's more evil in this situation again? The high school girl with anger issues who didn't know anything about her family's dark past till now and is, and is upset about it, or the three dipshits with guns laughing at the quote-unquote hellspawn with sinister smiles shooting Ida and considering torturing her before outright killing her. And by the way, by the way, they knew Aya didn't know about her family's bullshit past. They never actually asked her, so wait, your mother never told you what really happened? Or she never brought out your dark secrets? No, they fucking knew that Aya was completely oblivious of all the bullshit that happened with her families. However, the torment was interrupted by explosions going off, which were caused by none other than Suzuko Ishishima. So Aya's mom knew this for a while. You know what? I'll comment on this afterward. We're close to done fin uh, summarizing this plot. We're close. We're close. We're almost done. Bear with me. So after Suzuko calls Kumi selfish for letting her children do all the gunt grunt work, Haruki gets pissed and stupidly attacks her without his gun, only to get his neck snapped so casually. Suzuko also reveals something that's not really only pointless, but it happens to be a running motif whenever I watch a shitty anime. It's like a bane of my existence. Suzuko reveals that the reason she and Shigeyuki's parents did what they did is because Yumi and Kumi's father killed both Suzuko and Shigeyuki's parents. So, for you see, this was just nothing but an endless circle of fate for everyone in this room right now. Now why, oh why, is it that the worst anime I have ever seen in my life has some crappy forced tie-in to fate or destiny or some shit like that? The first season of Ikitosin, all of the main characters were tied to the fates of their previous three kingdom incarnations. In Green Green, the male and female lead were in love with each other in previous incarnations, but it wasn't meant to be because... It's just fate. No explanation beyond that. And now finally, Master of Martial Hearts. Less than four minutes of this show left. Suzuko now brings up that the crazy cycle of revenge is also tied into fate. Anyways, back to what could laughably be called the plot. Miko and Natsume were smart enough to try to shoot Suzuko, but she casually dodges the bullets like it was nothing and snaps both of their necks. And if you're wondering, oh, what co there was a cosplay fetish theme for all these characters in this anime, what the hell was Suzuko's? She didn't have one. She looked like a straight up brawler, which is probably why she kicked their asses so easily. Anyways, 
Susuko apologizes to Aya about keeping the past a secret while patching her up, but and then she carries her out of the built. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, that's someone who wasn't retarded would have done. No, instead to atone for Aya's sins. That was in the English script. Aya's sins, not her own. Suzuko lets Aya leave the exploding and burning building while Suzuko herself stays to die in it. However, Suzuko notices the text sent from the Martial Heart regarding that the crystal is still incomplete and the wheels of fate still turn. So building explodes, Aya's limping away from it. And then we cut to Natsumi's mother, Kumi, who was busy stabbing pictures of Aya's face with a box cutter. Oh, and she looks like a yandere psycho while doing this. No, I I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that. She didn't have the face of, you ruined my life, I want to kill you so much. She actually has the face of, I want to kill you so much because I love you. Seriously, she was blushing with a weird smile on her face while doing this. Anyways... She hears a doorbell ring, and as she answers it, she lets out a silent scream, followed by an immediate cut to black, music stops with it, credits roll a few seconds later, end of the series. So, in regards to this entire episode, as well as the conclusion of the entire series, I only speak for myself when I say, what the fuck happened? Now, I still have more questions and comments about this whole ordeal, and before anyone jumps about me hating this ending because it was too dark and depressing, that's not it. Dark endings are pretty sad, true. And I'm gonna feel it, no doubt, if the ending was well executed. But truthfully, I don't really hate them. The School Days anime adaptation actually made a smart move for going for the sudden dark and depressing ending. Because after discussing it recently uh, with my buddy Jordan, we realized that not every character deserves a happy ending. Had School Days ended on a happier note, fans would have been even more pissed off at the writing f for the already despised characters. And uh, another spoiler for the season one of Walking Dead, and at this point, everyone who cares about it probably already played and experienced it, but I actually really did like that ending to Walking Dead season one. I didn't want to see Lee Everett die, but I accepted it because the final scene of that game was that heartful. And guys, the director's cut ending to Little Shop of Horrors, the theatrical version, Rick Moranis, Man, have you seen that ending? Man, check it out. It is so freaking amazing. Way better than the uh, theatrical cut. So I'm not bagging Master of Martial Hearts just because it was a downer ending. I'm bagging it because it makes no sense. Here's my list of questions and reasons why. Point number one. Why the hell would Miko and Natsume go after Aya for their revenge first and not Suzuko, since the latter was the one most responsible for what happened to their mothers, while the former didn't know jack about shit till it was explained to her at the last minute? In fact, they, sh they know that Suzuko's mother's still alive. They said they were going to go after her after they're done with Aya, but logically, if you have beef with somebody, go after that somebody first, and then deal with their family members maybe second. Now, I could probably buy that Miko is so fucking angry for 15 years that she sna snapped and logic is out of the window with her, but the other two people involved, they seemed a little more sane. No one, not one person commented on the idea of wait. I want to kill Suzuko first since she destroyed my mom and uh, we'll think about getting after I. How's that sound? No, no discussion about that. Point number two. Miko, Natsumi, and Haruki are pissed at Aya and her family because of a tournament roughly 20 years ago that destroyed their families and left them emotionally and possibly psychologically scarred for life. So their plan was to have the exact same tournament that caused their families pain and anguish this whole time, even hoping that Aya would actually be the victor just like her mother, just because she's cold and evil as, as Suzuko? Wouldn't it make more sense if they got her to lose the tournament and have her go through the suffering Yumi and Kumi went through? Like the plan couldn't be staging a bullshit tournament, but then hiring bigger and badder opponents who are in on this plan to get Aya eliminated, and if each of them failed, they're just subjugated to the punishment as a result of their failure. So, 
that the martial heart thing still existed for 20 years going since Shigeyuki started it, or did it just get recently re- rebooted? I mean, they had a committee and chairman doing all this, but once it was revealed that Natsumi and Miko are the masterminds behind all this, it just got more confusing on how it all works. Did the chairman with the plastic surgery, did he just continue this tournament for a while after succeeding Shigeyuki? Or... And Miko just hijacked it, because before he died, he did mention something of a committee that would still be after Haruki if he got killed. Or did Suzuko kill them in the building as she was pouring gasoline and planting explosives? I mean, they did show a bunch of dead bodies dressed like men in black agents before she was pouring the gas. Point number four. Actually, who the hell was the chairman? I mean, I don't know anything about him as to why he would start this fucked up business or even agree to help Natsume and Miko out. All I know is that he used plastic surgery to alter his appearance, and that's about it. I mean, he's he, he was just there to tease whether or not it was Haruki that was behind all this at the end of episode 3. And he reappears in the final episode just to have a few lines, and then just abruptly dies. Point number 5. This sounds a little more rambling, and I brought this up uh, during the summary, but it bears repeating that the other participants of this so-called tournament really didn't know the risk of losing, as Miko said they were. I wouldn't bring up the other participants since I know they're just there for Aya to destroy and make the tournament look official, even though both Rin and Suma actually mentioned defeating previous opponents before. But the thing about the Daimanji sisters bugs me. See, they worked for the Martial Art Committee. They had some special privileges and probably knew more about the business. And they mentioned that they take defeated opponents to the quote-unquote Dark Realm. They even said they go as far as outright killing them. They never once bring anything up about the whole sex slave trafficking deal. Point number six. So Natsumi was just pretending to be Aya's friend the whole fucking time just so she can observe her attitude and watch as the plan fold. Out of all three of the backstabbers, I call Natsumi's betrayal as total bullshit. Oh sure, all three of them being traitors are are BS to begin with, but considering there were hardly any hints of the sudden heel turns, Natsumi's turn was the most forced, and she had a lot of screen time too. Prior to this, she was just another one of those archetypical friend characters who cheered on the side. And like Miko, there were really no subtle hints about an ulterior motive, and as a result, it just feels completely forced for fake-ass drama. And again, before people harp on me considering that this is a good twist because you never saw it coming you do have to drop some hints in order to make the writing feel a little more consistent. Sure, you don't have to make it obvious, but if I were to watch it a second time around and then see some other stuff, I would go, oh, that explains why this happened later on. Actually, regarding, you know, hints, we didn't get anything up until this point. The only thing that was shown to be a hint was they did have a scene in episode 2 that introduced Natsumi's mother, and the only thing they showed was a close-up of a scar around her neck and that she was a mute. When you look at the scar, you go, oh, that's why she can't talk. I wonder how she got that. And that was the only legit hint that they dropped before this big bullshit info dump to reveal at the very last episode. Point number seven, when and how did Suzuko know about her daughter's involvement in the martial heart? She shows up like a deus ex machina in order to save Aya at the final episode, and again, like everything else, no real hints. I mean, in the episode itself, you do see her plant explosives and pour gasoline in order to set the building ablaze, but how she got from that point, nothing. Um... In the English dub, they made it sound like she knew about this for a while. She said something along the lines of, I try not to interfere with, uh, with my daughter, with the, uh, with my daughter's, uh, business. That was a mistake. 
and the subtitled version, she just, it, it sounded like she just found out about it. And if she did know sooner, she should have acted sooner. I mean, my God, that's actually a pretty big, important deal. I mean, I know if you're a mother, you probably don't want to be too involved in your daughter's business, but considering that she's repeating a dark part of your history, yeah, you should have stepped in sooner if you did know sooner. Point number eight. Who was it that sent the text message to Aya's cell phone as the building was burning down? Uh, they would drop a hint so Aya would follow fate's path. But I always assumed that the text messages, now with everything's revealed, that was either Miko or the chairman sending the text. And now they're both dead, yet here it is. One more match according to the Marshall Hart message. Um, which leads me to point number nine. Are there supernatural elements or is everything a big lie? I mean, the tournament was thought to be a secret tournament with a wish of the participants' heart's desire as the prize, but it was revealed to be a bunch of hippy-dippy baloney. Yet at the final episode, my reading psychics, Akuma levels of aggression, and destiny are added to the mix. So, what the hell? Point number 10. Did the losers of the tournament just die in the fire or did the animators just completely forgot about them? You don't see them anymore after Natsume brings up how Suzuko defeated Yumi and Kumi. In fact, their blocking was made no sense. I mean, even though Aya, Haruki, Natsume, and Miko stood completely still for a good chunk of the time, they actually changed the blocking of the loser participants. Like, for some reason, Miss Suma was sitting right behind Aya at, at one shot, and then she disappears again. So, judging from the horrid and often inconsistent animation with not only the blocking, but I even mentioned in my review the character design models themselves, I want to say that the writers and animators completely forgot about them, but mm, that's just me. You Feel free to interpret it however the hell you want to. So those are all the points, now to talk about some closing thoughts, even though this is going to be lengthy as well. It's a safe bet on an entire savings account to say that the person at the front door waiting Kumi at the final episode, despite what other theories online will tell you, that it is in fact Aya on the other side waiting to clean house. Wait, some of you might say, since they never showed who rang the doorbell, it could be anybody. No. No, it's Aya. For starters, remember how pissed and homicidal she acts in most of the fights and even being taunted by the lady in red? She never learned how to keep that under control. She never learned to quell it or anything. So a woman who went through fighting a bunch of people, including her teacher, killed her final opponent, found out her only friends were backstabbers and wanted her dead since day one, and not to mention her mother just staying behind the building to die in the fire, and that's why I said Suzuko's actions at the end were retarded. I understand you fucked up and you want to and you did some bad things in the past and you want to atone for your sins and you think this is a way you should do it. But now is not a good time to abandon your daughter. But with all that shit about Aya, answer me this question. Is Aya going to be a okay from this point forward? Time's up. Answers no. No, she won't. She's, she's going to go kill Natsumi's mother and probably go insane for the rest of her life. There's no, no optimistic way for me to interpret this. Aya's probably going to be a serial killer at this point. Gee, how uplifting. I remember in the first episode, everyone was really happy, cheery, and wanted to go and eat some burgers. Now back to my original question about the end of the series. What the hell happened? Seriously, it's like the creators regretted greenlighting this and wanted to have this series destroyed from the very beginning. But since they were moving at a slower pace, they just rushed out the final episode, killed off 90% of the characters, and ended in the most cruel, mean-spirited way they could have. In fact, the final episode was titled Flames, and while there was fire in the episode, it could be a double meaning stating that, the, that this franchise here would go up in smoke. See, the themes of friendship and the motivation for Aya to keep doing what she was doing got tossed out the fucking window for a half-assed revenge plot. I really, really wanted to research why the show went from bad to holy shit, that's the worst in record time. 
Ever seen a show so bad you just wanted to know how it became, how bad it was? Well, that's how I felt like after seeing this. However, I was unable to find anything online, no interviews, nothing. I'm assuming that this OVA bombed so hard that there's just not enough care in the world. Because, yeah, this ending sucked hard, but it was just amazing on how train-wrecking bad it was. Like, as if the cargo was carrying toxic waste throughout its trip, and crash, spill, mutants. And they even made a three-volume manga after the OVA, mind you. I don't even know how that happened. And so, those are my final thoughts on what could possibly be the worst ending I have ever seen in any anime series by far. Taking an already poor quality show and somehow making it way worse, destroying themes of friendship in order for a betrayal, contrived stuff, making the show more mean-spirited in tone, really, really crappy character motivations, and all executed with the laziest of writing and animation. Folks, I sure hope this gives you some insight on how bad this ending was, as well as the rest of the anime is. Hopefully, I'll find something much better in quality to review. Hell, that for CC and Vicky Tosin, I'm actually anticipating it. I'm actually looking forward to it at this point. Well, anyways, with all that said, this is Darkscreen217, signing out.